Backpack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind the scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. Podcast episode 133. Dexter Henry Bryan Fonseca here. You wherever you are. And we have a guest. I've been trying to get this person on the podcast for quite some time. A uh, good friend of mine. We go way back to when way I was back. working for the New York Post and she was working for New York One. And we just used to cover the same stuff. We were in all the same places for sports. Priya Desai. She's now a reporter at Sports Illustrated. Um, second guest in a row from Sports Illustrated, uh, mm. interestingly enough. And Priya, what's up? Hi, how are you? Old friend is right. It's been like 12 years. I know. It makes us is feel that old. how long we've been doing this? I'm so old. <laughs> <laughs> that I don't think I knew. I didn't, I didn't know you guys went back that long. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're talking about 2007, 2008, somewhere around that time. So I think it may have been like 2006. Yeah, might might be far might be far back as that. That was my first year out of school, so that might be that. Yeah, it's a mm-hmm. long time. Um, glad you glad you were well, Brian. Brian, what did you say? How young were you at that time? I was in middle school. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Bye. <laughs> Priya, if that doesn't make us feel old, I don't know what will. I have no idea what will make us feel old. Other than that, every every time Dex brings up something from like the two thousands, I think about where I was at that time, and I'm like, God damn, yo. And, and we're like, God damn. <laughs> what year were you born? 94. Oh, my God. <laughs> Wait, what? What's the matter? What? That's going to be a clip. Do I look older? I just I mean, didn't now, know probably. people were born in 1994. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what, though? You know what, Priya? That's how I am when I hear kids that they're born in, like, 2001 oh. or, like, after 9-11. I'm like, Wait, what? Like that's a thing. That, that, ma- that like, makes you feel. That makes him feel old now. That makes him feel old. Priya, I'm progress. I'm gonna be your generation eventually. You know. That's true. You will be. Yeah. You will be. You will be here at some point. That is true. And we will be sure will. much older. Uh, I'm gonna leave it at that for the age talk. Priya, uh, you are well. How, how have things been for you during this pandemic and protest life that we're living? Interesting times, huh? Yes. Uh, it has. I don't remember March, right? Like I, I don't, re- I can't remember what it felt like. I can, I can remember like a movie. Like I'm seeing myself in my apartment for pretty much three months straight and trying to keep working. And, you know, I think we were also busy tr- and trying to figure out how we can continue to do our jobs with the situation at hand that I didn't even have a minute to sort of sit back and, and realize what we're experiencing. Um, and then that all changed a, a week and a half ago. Yeah. And yeah. It kind of felt like things were just kind of, I don't want to say normalized. Cause I think we were a long way from that, especially here in New York, but it felt like we were cut, you know, which everything was starting to open up and then obviously the protest started and we'll get into more of that later. And that kind of has, has really changed everything. But I want to start people back with you because I've known you for quite some time. Um, whenever we get fellow sports journalists on here, we like to go back and say, all right, how did it all get started? How did Priya decide get here? Um, wh- what inspired you to do sports journal- journalism? And just tell us a little bit about your journey. Ooh, all right. Well, I'll try to keep it short because it was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> started in 2002. When uh, What were you doing in 2002? Brian? Uh... Seven? Brian, you were eight? I was don't, talk, don't tell me. We don't have to answer that question. We, we I, that was, I think that was the year that I got suspended from school the first time. Oh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, 
next. I don't know if I told you that story, but that's a good one. But another, that's you have another not line. for another day. Yes, go ahead, Priya. <laughs> well, um, while he was being suspended, I decided that I was just going to move to New York and be a journalist because that's what you do in your twenties. You think it's just that's just what you do, and I moved to New York and. It did not happen that way. I knew nobody. I had zero contacts. And I just started trying to connect with as many people as possible. That didn't really do anything. And then I got into a program. By, it's called IRTS. It's the International Radio and Television Society. I don't even know if it's still around. But they have a program every year where you write, you submit an application. You don't pay for it. You write an essay and you are invited to a workshop and then a job fair and it's for it's a diversity job fair and that's when i met someone from new york one the head of hr and i got hired so that program really it changed my life cuz i had no i didn't have that connection of like the syracuse journalism grads had mm -hmm. and the columbia we talk about that a lot here the medills like i didn't have that but this 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 um, society really kind of started my career and I, I ended up at New York One and it was so exciting like to have, be in this market at that age. And I didn't start off on sports. There was no openings in the sports department at the time. I covered news and politics for the first five years or so and saw every inch of New York and the five boroughs. And it was a really cool experience. And then finally there was a spot open Full time in sports, and I started there for another six. Years. I was almost a decade in New York one. Oh my god! <laughs> and you know, I, I kind of saw the how local news was changing and television broadcast in general. And I then went over to SI, where I was able to combine both my background, both in breaking news and politics and, and sports. Yeah, I, I want to say this for people who don't know because I, I remember when I met you, Priya. Um, one of the first times I met you, I think I, I remember my first time meeting you actually. And I remember thinking at the time there was not, and I want people to know this, what Priya did, Priya was a one man band journalist. So a lot of what she did, we both did the same thing. She shot her own video, wrote her own stories, was doing her own stuff on camera. And there really weren't any other women doing it. Like I'm trying to think about that. I remember that stood it out and to also see a fellow minority <laughs> doing it too, was just like, Oh man, like I couldn't believe this was was happening. Were, were you? I feel like I was always aware of my place at that time in the New York sports scene. Were you aware of like the fact that you were the only person doing this, both as a female and a minority? Oh, absolutely. And I'm sure we'll get into this, but at the time in your 20s, I had this attitude of feeling grateful, so I didn't <laughs> question it a lot. It was just more like, oh, I can't believe I get this opportunity, which I think the next generation. Michael, you can tell us if this is correct or not. Brian, yes. That, Brian, I'm sorry, Brian. <laughs> Michael's, actually, Michael's actually my brother's name. So, you know, this is, that, you well, know what I mean? Like, I ain't mad at it. <laughs> Brian, this is what you, you get. This is what you get. Uh, you look forward to is you just sometimes blank on a lot of things. <laughs> Comes with it. Um, but I think, you got, I think you're both younger than you're giving yourselves credit for, but fair enough. <laughs> Don't worry, <H> stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Priya and I, we're not going to answer that. But go ahead, Priya. <laughs> Fine, whatever. <laughs> I, yeah, it, it was, I, I, and the, this next generation is that idea of like being grateful is ridiculous. I'm there to do a job. I do it really well. I shouldn't be grateful. This should be a, a mutual relationship between employer and, and employee. So I was always cognizant of it. I just, hadn't found my voice or my strength to say anything about it. If that makes sense. Yeah. That yeah. makes a whole lot of I, sense. I was wondering about that because Dexter and I have talked about this as, you know, he's brought in other people from, I guess that time where he first broke in as well and how different it is compared to now where there's not, and Dex, we've talked about the structured path, right? Like back then, if you were like a sports writer, for example, you would typically go to probably a newspaper They'll have you do high school. Maybe you'll work your way up to college. Maybe you'll get right. to the pros. Maybe you'll get a beat or whatever. And now the path is sort of all over the place. There's blogs everywhere. There's different websites to do a bunch of different things. You can get in through a variety of ways, but that also, you know, it makes it makes the world almost too open. And I guess, like, what can you say in terms of what, how you see people navigating it now as opposed to, you know, during that time? 
I think that the amount, the different amount, the number of media outlets available is wonderful. There's definitely some bad sides to that, but it's so wonderful be that we don't, there's not this, I always felt that there was this fear of competing against one another. So when you see that I'm the only woman of color at New York One and the, the first one to cover sports and there's a fear that because there's so just limited opportunities that you never really want to help one another out. And now it's, it's a little different because there's a lot more opportunity to get your voice out there. It's still hard when yeah. you don't have a network and those connections don't get me wrong, but I hope that this, that competition that I saw a lot growing up, I'm just saying even between Indians that, right has lessened. I mean, there are not a ton of South Asians in sports, but uh, I can tell you that we all know each other and we all support each other. And we're all like, there's no sort of internal, like, well, I don't want that person in, on my podcast or my network, or it's not like that. And right. I think that's one good thing about having a lot more options besides just the networks and, you know, radio. Right. It, right. It, yeah. it, it, it actually brings opportunities for like all of us of minorities, three different minorities from three different backgrounds to come together mm -hmm. and be on a podcast and actually, you know, talk about some of these things. I think that's definitely important. Now, you've been at SI for what, six six years it's been, uh, Priya? You've been, or is it more? It'll be six years in August. Yeah, wow. And and you made, you made that transition from local television to digital. Um, what's been your, what? there's been a lot that's going on at SI as a lot has been documented and, and we've known. And there's been a lot of changes in terms of things with ownership. Um, and, and we're going to get into that. What has been your ride at, at SI? I mean, what, what what has that been like in terms of, you know, you working there? Uh, well, I think any Google search will show you everything that's happened just in the seven or eight months. But um, it's been an experience. <laughs> I, I also, we're seeing the we're seeing what happens when for the past 10, 15, 20 years, these media companies just take on more and more debt and they try to buy all these different uh, titles and, and, and do some, and, and then fail at it and then sell that property off to the next person to deal with it. Yep. And you're seeing the end result of that, right? You're seeing so many uh, prior to the pandemic layoffs and buyouts and, and investment companies coming in and, and buying these media companies and just completely destroying them. And to, to see that firsthand, you learn a lot about capitalism and mm. power and the power of money. What Now, SI obviously had a well-documented, well-publicized layoff situation where a lot of people, including friends who you know I know worked there, Deontay Prince, former editor of Crossover, um, who's been on this podcast a couple of times. Um, when you saw that and you see so many people go, and now I know from the news when we talk about this limited amounts of people of color um, work, work, working there, as somebody who works there, what does that say? What does that speak to you as a woman of color who works there, Priya? Um, first of all, I, I told you so is what I want to say because <laughs> there's, this isn't new to this year, right? Or even the past five years, past 10 years, we've been talking about this. And when companies start to become conglomerates and then conglomerates start to sell off those companies. Like what happened with sports illustrated. Listen, there was, it's not like SI suddenly found itself in precarious times. There are multiple sales that happen. There are multiple CEOs who walked away with massive golden parachutes and you know, who ends up paying the price in the layoffs are those people who don't have the big followings and didn't have the support of their editors and didn't have the, were the favorites and weren't able to build this like huge name up for themselves. That's who ends up suffering. And it also tends to be black and brown people. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's something that we talked about a lot. Also, can you, can you speak more to, I guess the numbers aspect of it? Because, and I've experienced this firsthand last year in a situation that I'm not going to talk about publicly, but Dexter knows what I'm talking about, where sometimes some people who play the numbers game and can benefit to it mm. to a point, they can still, yeah, yeah, that thing. They could still get on with a certain network and 
that could sort of get manipulated in a different way. But there's different ways to accumulate these numbers now, and a lot of people uh, are doing it in a way that outlets can't necessarily see through. And I'm wondering, like, how does that come into effect when all this is is going on? Because it's become a numbers game more than it's become almost a quality game, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Wait, are we like we're referring to what the numbers as far as we're talking about clicks, followers, or followers, numbers? Yeah, as people yeah, 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 yeah. want to say and things like that, as yeah. opposed to as opposed mm-hmm. to you know there being the like, yeah, right, as opposed to the work. Um, it's. Absolutely, that's absolutely what it is. They, these media companies are expecting ru- journalists to be their PR department, and because no one's really figured out how to make money in media, that's the ugly secret. I don't even think it's a secret. It's true. No one has. No one has. That's why we keep and, saying it. Right. Right. And it then. You're right. These it's on these journalists to stay relevant on Twitter. And look, I love Twitter. I'm on I'm on it all the time. But like, I need X amount of followers. I need this amount of engagement. And there are, I think companies would be lying if they said they didn't look at your social media for pure engagement and numbers before they hired you. Mm-hmm. And then you see, at, at, I'm sure we were going to talk about this. You see what happened at um, the Pittsburgh Gazette. Yes, we'll get into that. Yes. Yeah. So that's interesting, right? Because they came after her social media. But I'm sure there's pressure to make sure that you are can trend on social media and that your stuff is being seen. So that whole situation I should be discussed moving forward with these media companies on what exactly you want your journalists to do with their social media. Like you want it to benefit you, but the moment it crosses a line, then you get punished for it. Or it crosses there, whatever line they think that is. Yeah, whatever line they think that is, right. <laughs> yeah, is there a way we could see a shift in that, like post-pandemic and post, I guess, everything that's going on now? Like, no. people are, are people going to prioritize the work ever, or is this just going to be what it is, and then we're going to continue to see layoffs and companies, you know, change ownership every three to five years and, and so? Uh, I say no right now because, once again, I there's – there's no nobody really knows how to make money right now and we thought it was through subscriptions then we just saw what happened at the athletic they just had a bunch of layoffs well, and they could have done a better job hiring out the gate but that's just my opinion i i don't i didn't i subscribed to them for free for a month and then i stopped that's a whole it's a whole nother <laughs> god media is just a mess i hope there's no one young listening to this saying i'm forget it i'm not going to be in journalism no, but, but it's, i think but it's hard, though. It's hard, like, because I'm thinking about that now because I just graduated school a few years ago, and now I'm looking at how much has changed in just just those few years. And I'm like, yo, why would – honestly, why would you want to – why would you want to go this route at this point? Like, I don't know. You're not going to have <laughs> – you're not, you're not going to have the cushion unless, like, you know, your dad was, like, famous for doing this or something like that. You know what I mean? Or your mom was, like, a famous producer or whatever the case may mm-hmm. be. But unless you have that in, like, how are you – like – when it comes down to things like just medical benefits and things like that, that you should be able to secure on a regular salary, where, where are you getting that? Because like for me, for example, I'm 26 now. I have not had benefits before any job that I've had in media. I haven't had, haven't had benefits, haven't had healthcare. I don't have healthcare right now. We're in a pandemic. You know what I mean? Like, so what are, what are we talking about? Yeah. And so when I mentioned earlier about there's so many different options out there and different ways to have your work seen. And that's something a lot of, I'm like right on the cusp of millennial and Gen X, but a lot of Gen Xers and older say like, there's so much, uh, w- so many other ways out there to show your work. And you're like, yeah, but those ways don't give me healthcare or a 401k. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. And that that's problematic, right? Like those are, it's wild that you are tied down to any job because you want to make sure that you have insurance. And unless you have wealthy parents and you have that cushion, you don't have that option of saying, I'm going to do whatever I want and get my voice out there. Um, it's a big question that needs to be answered and looked at, I think, by a lot of people probably in my generation and older. Like, how are we going to fix this problem for those who are coming up and want to, like, you know, we want to pass the baton, baton to in journalism. Journalism is very important. I don't want to hear anything about, you know, fake news and 
all that nonsense. I have a lot of issues with what the large networks are doing. But when it comes to people on the ground covering these protests, which yeah. after 11 o'clock at night, it wasn't CNN. It wasn't MSNBC. Mm. It was all these local reporters on the ground with no security, nothing, getting the information out at 1, 2, 3 in the morning. And we have to have those people out there yep. to be able to show what's actually going on. Hey everybody, Brian Fonseca here to tell you about the multi-time award winning series Out Now that is Side Hustle, which is created, executive produced, hosted, and edited by me, Brian Fonseca. Side Hustle is a sit-down interview series that taps into sacrifice, the odd avenues taken to progress closer to your ultimate dreams, and some jokes as well. Because you know, we always gotta find funny and we always gotta find time to laugh. Side Hustle has been named to the best TV and web series category at several different film festivals, including the 2020 International New York Film Festival, the New York Movie Awards, and a host of others. Be sure to watch season one in full right now on either BrianFonseca.net or YouTube.com slash Brian Fonseca. Brian with a Y, remember. All eight episodes, trailers, teasers, and promo are free to watch, and the series as a whole is approximately two hours long. Everyone has a story. Everyone has a side hustle. Be sure to watch season one, out now. I think you bring up this good point, Priya, about you know people who want to do stuff independently, even myself, and doing that. It's hard because it's hard to put your time within what you're doing that actually pays the bills, and also getting funding for that. And a lot of us that don't have yeah. rich mom or rich dad to do that, it takes so much to do it. You know, like I have to reach out to people. People don't think about this. When I do sideline stories, reach out, I'm setting it up. I'm booking these guests. Mm -hmm. I'm doing all this stuff myself. It takes a lot of stuff to, to do this. I want to look at, because we've worked in, you know, you've worked in two different newsrooms and Brian has seen some of this and I've definitely seen him done this. When you go into these oh, yeah. newsrooms, as many people know, there aren't a lot of people that look like any of us here on this podcast, right? There is clearly a lack of diversity um, in this. Now, a lot of companies talk about wanting to be more diverse, but numbers, statistics have actually shown doesn't reflect that. What do you, are you encouraged by what people are saying they're doing, Priya, to address the lack of diversity? Are people addressing the lack of diversity? What's going on? What's going on from what you see as well? Do you, would this question have been different two weeks ago? No, <laughs> no. The question, no. no. And, and, I, I, and I don't mean to cut you off. We'll get into that because, you know, and I talked to you about this uh, off air, which is just that a lot of people are making statements about what they're going to do to help diversity. I, I'm not buying into all of that yet. And so for me, no, I still if we had recorded this two weeks ago, I still would have asked you that same question and had the same question. It's like, hey, what are people really doing and truly doing to try to impact this? Well, I think that. I ask you that question because I think the answer is very different now than it was two weeks ago. Uh, you are seeing all these organizations talk about their commitment to diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, A, is that going to happen? B, are you going to put an immense amount of pressure now on all your new hires to basically fix all the mistakes that you guys have been making for the past decade? Mm two decades forever, however long forever. Been yeah. forever. <laughs> and right. then do you want to be, is there, you know, you also have to think about who you're hiring and the pressure you're putting on them. And then the accusations then about diversity hires are going to start time and time again after this, like, Oh, that was a diversity hire. I mean, not openly, but right. a little bit more secretive. Like everyone, everyone's just gonna be a little bit more polite now. Let's let, let me put it that way. Mm. That's how I see. Hmm. Everyone's going to be a little bit more polite, but do I think the people who are in charge making the decisions are looking in the mirror and saying, how did I contribute to this? No, because that would then require an apology, which is very difficult to get. And I've told anyone who is called to ask me, you know, what do we do about this? I'm like, you have to, somebody has to take the time to apologize and say, I am responsible for this, which means I'm responsible for fixing it. I'm here. How do we do this? And unless that happens, I don't want to sit around and, and help you and, and basically have a second job in, in completely restructuring your diversity hires. Like, that's not that's not what I'm here for. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that when I, I do think this is a time where people should be holding 
uh, management and their jobs accountable. And when they say they stand with Black Lives Matter, they stand with people of color, they should be asking them, well, how exactly is that going to work and what you're going to do? And I think the responses you see from companies, um, whether positive or negative, will tell you a lot about what they're really going to do. If they can't come up with actionable plans, if they can't say they're actually going to do this, then it's not good. And where I agree with you, Priya, 100% on this, I agree with everything you said, but really agree with you is that it is not on us. <laughs> it is definitely not on me as a black person to fix mm -hmm. the systemic racism that exists. It is not on you uh, as a South Asian or Brian as a Puerto Rican man to fix the systemic racism that there is. And I think there's still a, a look at like, hey, we need to unite and all come together. Like saying unity acts like there's some part that we need to contribute to this. And <laughs> no, like I'm not, I'm not with that. So if these companies and leaders and whoever we work for, if you're really not about it, then just step aside, man. But you're right. You make a great point. It's going to put pressure on the people that come in to fix the mistakes of the past. And that's not necessarily fair to those people as well. I know. And look, I, I, there's going to be no other choice than to really put our, our hands in there and, and do the work to help make this change. Right. That, that I mean, we can't just leave it up to right. the people in charge. And that being said, we have to push for, CEOs and decision makers and HRs to reflect the rest of this country because you can have the most diverse, and I think that's such a cop out word, right? It's just such a, such a pretty word. Yeah. Oh, we're so yeah. diverse. <laughs> um, hire black and brown people in positions of power. It cannot just be, oh, we have this many people on camera and this many editors and, and producers because look what happened to Jamila Hill and Michael Smith. Mm -hmm. yeah. It came down to them standing up for what they wanted to talk about. The people in power were like, see ya. So ESPN can be as diverse as it wants in front of the camera and maybe even behind the camera, but I wanna know the ones that get those golden parachutes when yeah. everything goes down. Where is the representation there? Yeah, yes. that, that was something that I wanted to bring up as well, because that's where it's really going to start. I know that we've all, especially you guys, have been in a bunch of offices where, as Dexter mentioned, you're kind of the only one that looks like you <laughs> when you're there. And, you know, it's happened even to me on many occasions, even in just media rooms in general. Like you go to an NBA media room and 90 percent of it is going to be white people covering basketball, which doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and you're talking about like a lot of their. So if you're talking about 90 percent of media writers that are, you know, white dudes, usually dudes, that's another thing. And then you're talking about their editors on top of them who are calling the shots and telling them what to do. Like, they're almost always just, where do you ever see the black editors, the brown editors, and the people in positions of power that Priya is talking about who are actually making these decisions, the CEOs and the people right under them? And, you know, that's where systemically, like, shit happens. And that's where right now... That's what needs to happen is getting people of color in those positions. Otherwise, if it's just going to be white people and you sort of put this on white people to change it, they're not going to change it because they haven't changed it over the course of however long this has been going on. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not, mm -hmm. without getting too specific, I will say that from, from my experience, what I'm seeing is uh, a lot of white people when called to action for this, it is, I think some of them think that they can put out blanket statements. I think some companies have done that now. I can just say I stand with Black Lives Matter but they're not addressing real issues. So they're not mentioning systemic racism, right? They're not mentioning police brutality. Um, they're not mentioning anything with the police or social injustice. And if you're a company that's done that in your statement, one, you're whack. Two, like, you're not doing anything to help. And if you're not talking about how you're gonna even change the culture in your workplace, you're you're totally missing the point. And you're not, you're not doing it. But what I've seen is I kind of, I don't, I, I don't, I'm kind of like Priya. I don't believe that the people that have benefited from these systems in the past are all of a sudden going to be like, hey, you know what? Let's stop this and let's change this. They have no motivation to, and they actually don't believe that a lot of their viewership and but, readership will actually go along with the message of standing with black and brown people on this. But they should. And the reason why they in should. In a perfect is world, they should. They should, but it, you know what it is because ultimately it's gonna help them. If you really believe you're, if you really believe you're that good at what you do, right? If you really believe you're that good at what you do, 
why wouldn't you want better teammates? You have a lot of mediocrity in your staff that's just able to get by on certain things that the way other people look like are not able to get by on. So that would be able to help you help you do your job, and you're going to have more qualified workers because time and time again, I'm sure this has happened to all of us, you put up you know, two resumes against each other. One of them could look way better than the other, but this person has a connection and looks a certain way, so they're going to take this person instead because that person looks the part. If you start going after the people who are actually the most qualified and not this, what's the bullshit phrase that I hate, Dexter? The higher the, the, the higher best the people. Best the best job, people. Person. Which is another, <laughs> it's like it's like diversity. It's another cop-out, right? Just like, the yeah, the, why do I see so many, my, like, absolutely mediocre trash journalist on air if you're only hiring the best people because right. that's not the thing. Right. like that's where it starts right. if like if, if it like all right so stay true to the phrase and if you're really gonna hire the best people then let's talk about resumes let's talk about people who are most qualified let's talk about representation and people who actually deserve these opportunities because they haven't had one of this platform before and they deserve it because of the work they put in leading up to that that's just that's where all of this is going to change eventually if people just start thinking that way and again just putting more people that look like us in these sort of positions that really matter yeah and look it's, we're seeing it right now though like nobody's really giving a pass you we saw it with drew Brees. like yeah. people are, are calling people out for their bullshit statements and yeah. racism. bullshit ideologies and like that are that are point blank racist. Yeah. I, I saw it with Amazon. They put out a Black Lives Matter statement. And I was like, really Amazon? Yeah. Really? You guys were <laughs> like labor union put like destroyers. They were not they don't pay well. It's also just a horrible system to begin with. And then the whole, the controversy of COVID and having workers not being paid hazard pay and, and getting, being around other people with COVID and who are those people in those warehouses? Black They're and brown people, folks. Exactly. Yeah. You are making a ton of money off of poor, poor labor. And then you're going to put out that statement. It means nothing to me. I don't yeah. want to hear it. But yeah, and it's a, it's a great point because I think that, and I mean, this is not me bigging up my generation because Lord knows we have our flaws, but I think a lot of people in, I don't know, millennials, I guess you would say, they don't really care about systems in the same way that people who are much, much older, like in their 50s, have always adhered to. And I think that's where the change is going to come eventually. You know, obviously we need to start before then, but as you're seeing right now, people who are 30 something and younger don't give a shit about how things have always been. They just right. care about changing things for the better. And that's where I think real change is going to come from. Cause Dexter, we actually talked about this a little bit before this call and Priya, you just mentioned this as well. A lot of people are getting called out and a lot of people are going to see through the bullshit of like, this statement doesn't mention this. What are you guys actually doing really besides posting a black square and that sort of thing? Like people are going to start to see through that. And now because everyone has a voice for better or for worse, and at this point and at this time for the better at least a lot of people have the voice that they're going to use to actually lend voice to this stuff and, and actually try to make change you're right and and there's more of a collective energy that's happening and you're right like i tell a lot of my at my age either skew gen x or skew millennial and i everyone i work with is under the age of 30 and so i i, I skew a little bit more millennial so with my more gen x friends you know i tell them like Gen X did nothing. We stood around a lot and, and didn't really question a lot of things. And look, things like like the internet and, and Twitter and Facebook and all that has connected us globally. It give, has given us a global voice. So that is one thing that the millennials have gotten and have used um, to their advantage, to our advantage. I, I guess I'm still technically a millennial. Um, but what I see and what I think should be stressed a lot with that this generation, the next generation, the generation after that is you're right. Like there is no more system anymore. So when I, I always say I should have been born 10 years later. Like I, I think this next generation has done a really good job on, on voicing what they want. But like when I was at New York one, it was when, and that we were doing um, our yearly like report and, uh, pay raises and all that. So it was right when Lean In came out, the Sheryl Sandberg book. Mm -hmm. So all the women are like, we're going to lean in. And I was <laughs> like, yeah, we're going to lean in. And I was like heading this movement. And I, I told one of my friends, I was like, when you go in front of the news director, you know, you tell him that you're making 
thirty percent less than the woman that was hired that was had your position before you. She's like, I was like, lean in, and you hear Cheryl Sandberg told us how to do it. Uh, this woman is Indian, by the way. That I, I'm not gonna call her out by name. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she did it. She was like, this is why I think I deserve this much. The news director got up and said, who do you think you are? And He's, just berated her. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said those words exactly? Who do you think you are? Wow. Yes. Interesting. And wow. she came out shaking and in tears. I felt guilty because I was like the ringleader. Oh. And I, I was like, oh, wow. And that's kind of the stuff that we had to deal with because it the uh, it was it was all about like, don't rock the boat. Mm-hmm. It's all about, it's all about, you know, paying your dues. Mm-hmm. Bootstrap, <laughs> and you know you can't fight city hall, which is the dumbest statement ever. Because you, tech, you, of course, you can fight city hall. That's the whole point of our, our government and system. That was like kind of what we grew up with. So we, you know, believed in this meritocracy, a fake meritocracy, and you know, not rocking the boat. And, and that's not really happening as much anymore. And we're questioning authority. It's about questioning authority. Yes. We're finally at that point where. We will question authority, and we'll have ten people around us that'll support us to do that. Yes, uh, yes, and I've, I've I've recently experienced that. Speaking of questioning authority, um, you had a lot. To... <laughs> that, that makes me sound like like Priya is this extreme rebel. She kind of she kind of is, but no, you're just really good at segues. Uh, it's all fine. I'm pretty pretty good at that. Speaking of questioning authority, um, there's some of that at SI. We talked about what went on at SI, and you were one of the people, and should deserve a lot of credit for this that really spearheaded the union that was formed at SI, and I feel like more places should have this, the SI News Guild. Um, Talk to me about, I think it's pretty explanatory why there was a need for that, but why you kind of were like, hey, like this is now, we have to do this now. Why why now, Priya, when you guys did this and, and pushed forward with it? And, you know, how strong do you feel like the union is at this point now as we move forward? So I had never been part of a union prior to this. I was at New York One, which is a notorious non-union shop, Mm-hmm. And uh, I think prior to me, th- people tried to unionize, and the the then president, he's long since retired, said, yeah, I think something to the effect of unionize. I can fire all of you there, and I have 50 resumes for each of your spot, which is which it's true. It was true. To, and so they never unionized, and I wasn't part of like my landscape at all. And about a year ago, when I saw another sale happening from, it went from timing to Meredith, Meredith to ABG. And every time, every time you see it, it's always the reporters and the non-click getting reporters and producers and editors that get fired. Mm. And these other people walk away with amazing sufferances and and, um, these huge golden parachutes. And I just kind of was tired of it. And it didn't even, I didn't even think about are we going to unionize? Because there was a union there. I should clarify. Huh. There was a union. I thought it was magazine writers. It was started ages ago. But, but, no, but nothing, but nothing for dot com and the media, the other media folks, right? Correct. So I more or less started just talking to other people who felt the same way I did. And there ended up being a group of 14 of us. We also ended up being all women who started, who came together and said, to management, these are the issues that we're having. These are the things that we need to fix, and what and how are we going to do that? Um, and then someone who is already part of the union, uh, Jack Dickey, was like, "Hey, we should expand our our, our union." And then, and I would it, it actually having everyone come together to sort of support this. It really shows how much numbers make a difference. Like mm. if you, the people who are the ones that are creating the content, their blood, sweat, and tears that are getting the clicks that clicks that are getting you the advertising dollars. We are the ones that need to have our voices heard. And it was really, uh, it was life changing. This past year has definitely been life changing for me uh, when it comes to the collective voice, for sure. Yeah, I'm sure it felt good to have the, the support of those people behind you for for that, for sure. Brian, you have something to say? Yeah. It, it... But was any of this, I mean, I'm sure it was difficult, but on what level was it really the most difficult for you, like, during all that? Uh, it was like having a second-time job, like a second full-time job between the meetings and getting other people who may not necessarily want to be part of the union or are scared to be part of the union, explaining to them why it's important. 
And there were times where I would come home, you know, you would work and then you would work on this other stuff. And I would come home after 12, 14 hours and I would just sit down on my sofa and not speak for the rest of the night. It was emotionally draining Yeah. because there were times where you're like, nothing's going to come out of this. You get really discouraged and disappointed. Uh, but what kept me going is like, there was never any really internal struggles. We were like, we're all in this together. Hmm. And when you're feeling down, I'll pick up the slack right. and, vi- and vice versa. But no, there were times where I was like, I think just legitimately depressed. Like I just, it just, it was, it really took a toll on me because you want to think that you can make a difference, but you are really going up against centuries of power and money. And without that, it's, it's, it's a, it's a hard fight. It really is. The Sports Walk is back. Watch season three of Backpack Broadcasting's original web series that brings you the opinions of real sports fans. The first two seasons and current season are available now for viewing on the Sports Walk YouTube channel and Facebook page. Check out the 2017 NYC WebFest official selection and see what other sports fans have to say on the hottest issues in sports today. It's easy. Just take the Sports Walk. think other media outlets should maybe look at something like what you guys did and sort of expanding your union of media outlets that don't have unions would you encourage people to do this um and why uh yeah i would encourage everyone to unionize it's it's a it's a difficult task you can we're seeing it too google it with conde nast with Hearst. it is a struggle because you are going to consolidate the newsroom's power into another entity when you unionize, right? It's all about power. All this comes down to power and power dynamics. Yeah. And you, you don't want it, to, it's unionizing and having a union to rely on. And you, when we talk about what happened in Pittsburgh, you mm-hmm. have someone who has your back and you don't have to be afraid to speak up because when I, prior to being at SI, the idea of speaking up and against your authority you were, you got scared. You're like, I'm going to be labeled a troublemaker and I'm going to end up being fired. And I don't know which one's worse being labeled a troublemaker or being fired, but those were really your two options. And now you have a union who's, who is, has a lawyer when you need a lawyer who has people to pick up the slack emotionally when you can't do it. And who have had experiences dealing with these, these, these media companies. Yeah. Yeah. And and I I think, I think, I was going to say, the biggest thing there is accountability. You can now hold the people in that power dynamic. You can hold the people that are above you. You can hold them accountable. Go ahead, Brian. Sorry. Yeah, and and we're seeing a lot of that, too, because, you know, you've seen the Ringer Union, obviously, lately. You've seen Vice do it lately. And then, you know, a lot of people walked out on Deadspin, and now they're trying to do something else. So Mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot of just shift all over the place. And I think it kind of comes back to what we were talking about early where generationally people are just like, they don't really care about structure in that way. And I wonder how it's going to obviously affect media moving forward. I mean, you know, because it's hard to, especially with everything going on right now, it's hard to project, but I, like, I don't quite have an answer. I don't know if you guys would have a better answer for that. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of all wait and see. Korea doesn't want any part of this. <laughs> no, I think... I don't have an answer. I think, I think it's, that, it's, that it's hard to have an answer because it's kind of a lot of wait and see. I mean, I personally feel like things that what SI did and what Priya did and, and, and other companies moving forward and just people speaking out more now is going to have a positive impact. I, I mean, I would like to be hopeful on that. However, I am disappointed when I see things like what I'm seeing for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, um, a paper that I read when I used to live in Pittsburgh, went to school in Pittsburgh. I had t- professors who taught me from the Post-Gazette. Um, so for people who don't know, just want to say the, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, allegedly, to be journalistically correct, has decided that black journalists can't cover protests because being black makes them biased. They had a reporter who kind of spoke out of this via social media. I thought she did something that was really dope. She took pictures following a Kenny Chesney concert of like just litter and destruction on the streets and was kind of like, this is kind of what happens after protests. And if you've been to 
anything around Kenny Chesney, you know there's not a lot of people that look like us at a Kenny Chesney concert. No, I, Kenny Chesney's cool. He's fine. But I think it's ridiculous to think that black people can't cover the protests because they're black and they're going to be biased. In fact, they have a voice and are maybe connected with certain things going around that community that somebody who's, let's say, white will not be able to get her, get her experience. Uh, Priya, what was your reaction when you saw this from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette? Um, Washington Post did a great job covering this. I sent, you, I sent it to you and you were like, yeah, we got to talk about this. What do you think about all this? So this is when I often, when, as I mentioned, I am a room full of people who are about 10 years younger than me. And I feel like I'm like this grizzled, like veteran who's like always super cranky and is like, nothing's going to change. We should keep fighting. But, you know, <laughs> until, the, until the power structure is demolished, nothing's going to change. And I always have to be like, you guys, there are some positive things out there. I'm sorry. I should end on a positive note. And then I see this and I'm like, I told you so. Like, <laughs> Alexis Johnson tweeted a joke. Right. It was a joke. And if you have half a brain, which not, I'm not assuming everyone does, a quarter of a brain, you would see that it was a little, it was, it was, a, it was a joke. And yes, there were some serious discussions to have out of that, but she wasn't reporting anything, right? Like, it was, and you again, you are asking your reporters to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you when it comes to people clicking on your stories. And then you turn on them when it doesn't, you don't, it, it goes too far. They didn't even have a social media policy. How you don't right. have a social media policy and you've just, you're going to make up the rules as they go. Right. And it could have been a handle. Look, if you are that much of an old school newspaper, you could have called her up and said, let's delete this tweet and have a discussion. Right. Um, she, when got, when she got backlash, she refused to, she was like, no, I'm, this is, I stand by what I said. And it was a joke. And I, I, I am pretty impressed with her in that sense. She was just like, to people on Twitter, she's like, it was a joke. And I'm, you can call me whatever you want to call me, but I'm a great reporter. And for them to then take her off the protest beat. Mm -hmm. And then on, there, and there's no way of explaining it, right? So the, the union, because they're, I think they're under the guild. The yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Right went to, and this is why unions are important, went to the publisher and said, we want an explanation. They couldn't give her them, they couldn't give them an explanation. So red flag number one, that's weird. <laughs> uh, then the Mike, Michael Santiago, I don't even know why he was suspended. Is it because he supported Alexis? No answer on that. This man won a Pulitzer Prize. It appears because okay. he, he appears, I, it appears, we can only say it appears because he publicly supported Alexis right. um, that he got, he got suspended. And again, like you said, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Pulitzer Prize. And, like what else do you have to like show to prove <laughs> that you are very good at your job? Right. That a support over a tweet or a tweet is going to pull you off at the most important like time for us yes. in our lifetimes for the black community. Like, are you kidding me? How stupid can you be? It makes no sense. Then you yep. look at the ownership. Yep. The ownership leans very right. Mm -hmm. Ah, of course. Very I mean, right. I mean, you know. But, but see, but see there, is, there is a problem. Alexis's tweet, which was a joke, as Priya said, but it also was brilliant because it brings up this great discussion that you might want to have about how you react to certain levels of destruction or mess in certain places, right? We like to villainize the people who are protesting or the rioters, but you know, not villainize the people who riot after people, their teams win a championship or a World Series or a right. concert, right? And that's kind of the point that she was making with that joke that I think, but what happens is the people who are upset about that, they're upset about that because they have to look at themselves and be like, oh, yeah, I'm killing these protesters and rioters, but I don't have a problem with this. and. The base of that newspaper probably is like that. And as I've learned in the last day, Brian knows what I'm laughing about. The base of uh, viewership or readership of a company, if they're really uh, far right and they have some racist tendencies, the company's probably going to listen to them. And that's sad that they're going to side with the racist and the ignorant folks and suspend a journalist and try to silence another journalist. It's very disturbing when you see that. I will say that much. The end, I, you can... You can argue about whether or not she should have tweeted it. And right. we, there have to be bigger discussions on, you know, being neutral, which like, I think Christina Omnipore said, I don't, uh, CNN, very well-known CNN uh, anchor 
reporter. She goes, I'm not there to be neutral. I'm there to be truthful, yes. right? Like let's stop both siding and no bias and that we have to re-examine what that looks like. And yeah. furthermore, but so what it comes down to is she can compartmentalize her job and her and her beliefs and her struggles and what she's had to deal with because that's what people of color do their entire lives. Mm -hmm. We it should actually be on our resume, ability to <laughs> compartmentalize. Word. Yeah. Like that's what makes a great journalist, right? Like how insulting to to take them both off of that beat. Um I uh, I hope they get sued. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and and at least but at least because the times we're in, like this stuff gets out and it gets onto a platform where a lot of people can see this and to our point earlier, a lot of people aren't going to want to just see through this and, you know, act like it didn't happen. Like this happened and this is out there. And sometimes when you're in, I guess, quote unquote, infamy, it works better for you in the long run. Yeah. I mean, look, Pittsburgh population, 23% of the population there is black. And the, staff, the staff of the Pittsburgh Pokes Gazette is what, 10% of the people that work there are black. I've had friends who've worked there. It's disappointing. Priya. I guess to wrap up and then like just bring it back uh, to sports again for a second. Are you encouraged by what you've seen in the sports world reaction to the protests that have been going on? Because we've seen some of the, I will call it some sports teams have had some bullshit statements. Some teams have had some really good statements. Some players have said some dumb stuff like Drew Brees and they've been called out rightfully so. Just if we look at the scope of how the sports world's reacted to that, and I'm working on a story about that. What do you, what do you think about how the sports world's reacted to everything that's going on? I think when sports come comes back, it's going to be uh, it's it's a brand new day. I'm not going to say it's better, but I'm going to say it's it's brand new. Uh, the vitriol and the constant controversy over kneeling, or even just wearing an "I can't breathe" shirt, or yeah. when I think the the Lynx wore "I can't breathe" shirt, and, and I believe that where police officers like walked out, they turned yeah, they walked yeah. out for whatever yeah. reason, they left. Yeah, that doesn't fly anymore and hearing yep. who was the first who was the first player that spoke out against drew Brees? i don't know who Ooh. the first was but there were so many like malcolm jenkins malcolm jenkins uh, well, LeBron, lebron was obviously one of the most notable oh you're right you're right you're right you're right yeah. you're right um it's again collective voice and collective energy makes a, a big difference and uh, things are going to be different i hope for how long? Like, I think it's, you can say things are going to be different, but for how long? Right. Yeah. I think that's Until the next thing happens, until, you know, God forbid we end up in some sort of international incident, like, and our energy and our, and our attention is on something else. Ugh. Will we still have, will we, will we still be working on this? Well, that's going to be the test, I think, right? Like, whenever, uh, because under this administration, that's a, you know, get quote unquote political, but under this administration, anything could fucking happen at this point where, you know, in two weeks, the conversation will shift into something else. And then we'll still, will people still be protesting and caring about black lives matter and actually be wary about like, Oh, the coronavirus is still here kind of sort of, and, and, uh, and some other places it's here like a lot, like rap more rapidly. And it's growing because, you know, people are just outside now and we haven't really found a remedy to that thing. So I guess like that'll all get tested within, especially these next five months for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. And we'll see. I would like to think that this is, cause this feels different to me, right? Like we've seen Trayvon Martin protests. We've seen protests for, I mean, there are too many names to name quite frankly, which is why we're protesting to begin with. But on top of that, it's like, this feels different because this is an accumulation of so much and especially when the other side is just so vehemently, among other things, wrong, and you could just tell, and the way that they're acting, and that's sort of amplified. Like now, you can sort of tell. Like this is this feels a little bit different, at least in the moment. Now, is it going to be sustainable? It, it is. It feels very different in the moment, but I'm still seeing a lot of thing. You know, when you you I appreciate any white allyship. I I do. Is that the correct? We can make it up. Allyship? I like oh. allyship. A allies? Yeah. Allies? allies? White allies. allies. White allies. allies. White allies. <laughs> um, but I like when, allyship better. <laughs> when it becomes a little bit more uh, showy and there's not a lot of depth to it, which I do see. I'm not going to call anyone on, but I do see it. 
that's the problem. Like we need to, it has to be about changing systems, not, you know, creating the next new PR blitz. Uh, I, th I think that it was, it was the Atlanta Journal Constitution. They were, there was a group in, and the AJC is a historic paper. Like there were talks of AJC shutting down and that it, I just thought that was awful, but they are one of the best papers in our country and amazing writers. And, um, but <laughs> I say that with a but they sent a group of three or four reporters, photographers, producers to Birmingham, um, during the protest and everyone were, they were roughed up or, uh, one producer, I think from a television station had his phone grabbed from him. Mm -hmm. And it made, you know, it made, <clears throat> it made the news and the reporters like, oh, but we're fine. We're fine. Don't worry about us. Don't worry about us. And then that was it. It was never discussed after that. Um, it was stolen by the right and saying, look at these, you know, thugs, whatever, any of name course. you want to use. They use. Of course. Instead of saying, hey, why didn't the newsroom maybe have a discussion about, there's one thing to have a live shot, right? We do that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's set up, but sending a reporter with a Facebook live camera uh, phone and going around filming protesters in an all black neighborhood that is just not a good move like there are a history of fbi coming into these neighborhoods and secretly filming and you know tapping phones and you a facebook live is not a news report it's you just filming people's faces without their consent and yeah people got angry no discussion came out of that, like mm -hmm. at all. It's all, it, and it, to me, so it seems very surface and we have to get past that surface to make actual change. Cause if we're going to stay on the surface, it'll be forgotten about in a year. I, yeah. I, 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 I cannot agree more. With also that being said, just bringing it back to journalism. Are you encouraged Priya? You, you know, you, you're, you're the grizzled veteran now, like me, the grizzled veteran at work with speaking to the people of Brian's generation. Are you encouraged that things journalistically can be better for them. Give some hope to the young people if you can. I do. I do because the, uh, A, because I don't want to be that grumpy <laughs> <laughs> old person who's like, in my day, um, no, my day was awful. Like there was all these steps that you had to take. And now some of those, those steps have been taken away. And, you know, you, these young people, you have an opportunity to start showing your voice way earlier and, and making it known. And it's your voices that matter. It's not even mine anymore. It is people who are 20, even 30 years old, who are in the beginning of their careers, you shape the things that we see and the, the stories that need to be told. And now it's no, it's no longer about working your way you know, to the six o'clock news or, you know, hoping that you have a connection at, you know, your dad has a connection at CNN to get you in there. Like you're, you, you have a voice, you have something that you want to talk about. You're doing it now. You're not going to listen to that news director who says, well, I don't know. We don't have the head count for it. Maybe in like one or two or three years, because guess what? Those news directors and those EPs, they're all unemployed now. And mm. we're still here. Mm. Yeah, that is true. true. I, it's funny. I know some of them. Um, that is that. That is absolutely true. That is true. Priya, thank you. This yeah. has been such a great conversation. I'm glad we finally got you on. And people should know the reason we didn't have Priya on before because Priya was so busy working on the union <laughs> stuff tirelessly. Like I would text her, and she's like, "Dex, yo, we're working on this. This is what we're doing." So she was working extremely hard, and I think what you did is extremely commendable. You know, I'm always proud of you. Um, Thank you. As another person of color that I saw in the field at a young age, at the same age, pr practically, I was always inspired by you and seeing what you did, and I still am like super proud of you. So, you I, know. I'm glad, and you know, it it shows just how many of us were like in the locker rooms, not a ton, mm -hmm. uh, because we're all we're all still we're all still still tight, which you have to be. And that, that, that's a, another thing I want to say. These are to yeah, go ahead. Color. Just. They will try to pit you against one another. Oh yeah! Don't do not fall for it. Yeah. Don't fall for it. And uh, you know, I in 2018 I subbed in for um, the SI Now show. It was me and uh, Luis Miguel. I'm going to butcher his last name. 
we'll just go with Luis Miguel. Luis, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to him today. I'm like, I, I can't probably oh. pronounce it. That's why I'm like, oh, maybe. But it, it doesn't matter. H A Garay. H A Garay. Okay, it was awful. I'm not going to try, but okay. <laughs> Luis is there. So it was but me I and have, Luis. We I were. Have, we were like I could do it. Luis and I were, um, we were, we were filling in as hosts for SI now. And, you know, we took our picture and we put it up on Instagram, like two immigrants, two people of color are hosting the show for the first time ever. It's 2018 and we're celebrating. And I always put up on my Instagram because anybody who looks like me, I want them to know, like, you can do this too. But at the same time, we're giving everyone a pass, right? We're giving them a pat out low. Look what SI did. Mm. Mm. for one day look what they did for one day and when we do that like i'm very careful now about putting stuff up like that when we do that it also reminds everyone there's so many limited opportunities limited opportunities and then you can end up competing against one another don't do that like mm. we are each other's network mm. at the yeah. end of the day, you know i think yeah. i think that's a great i don't want to add to i think that is a fantastic point because i think what people may not know like and i want to say this when pre and i in the mid-2000s when we started um, you know, Priya looked out for me. I looked out for Priya. So if Priya needed some sound for something, if Priya needed a mic held, we always looked out for each other. And we were in so many of the same places. And mm -hmm. I, and not just Priya, there were other minorities who were around that I could definitely speak on that too. Other reporters for many times throughout different papers and stuff I worked with. But yeah, we needed that sense of community because we're kind of all we have. So I know it's important. Yeah. I, I always appreciated you, sister. So, and you know, okay. you're still always... There for me and Brian, we try to I try to extend that knowledge to him as you know a, a younger minority who thinks we're old and grizzled veterans, but uh, I, I just... <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't. But that's Priya Desai. She is a reporter for Sports Illustrated. You can check out her work there. She also was very integral in starting the union at Sports Illustrated. So got to give you your flowers while while you're here down on that. Uh, Priya, keep up the great work. Um, and just don't get grumpy on me, man. Don't, don't, don't get grumpy. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in person soon. Cause it's been a long time since I've actually like seen I know. you. I know. Um, so we, we'll, we'll, we'll do that soon, but that's it for episode 133 of the Hotel podcast for the great Priya Desai, Brian Fonseca. I'm Dexter Henry. Till next time y'all. Peace. Bye.